everyone we'll go ahead and get started this is chris mcswain the president of the integrated benefits institute and i'm really uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to have this webinar today a couple of housekeeping rules is that everyone other than the presenters will be muted and uh, there's a place on the right hand side of your screen to uh, raise your questions and we'll handle those questions at the end uh, perhaps it would be great just to start with a little bit of a context Today's presentation is about an issue that's been in the limelight for the last couple of years, uh, prescription benefits management. And I think we all know there's been a, a lot of debate and sometimes what I would call public drama about who is to blame for high drug prices. And, and as a result, good questions are being asked about the cost and complexity of the uh, pharmaceutical and prescription benefits supply chain. We're so fortunate to have today's speakers that are going to address this issue from a couple of different angles. First, we'll have Chuck Reynolds, consultant with Benfield, a division of Gallagher Bassett Services. He'll talk about the employer research that he and his colleagues have conducted to better understand the employer experience and perspectives about prescription benefits management. And then, <clears throat> Chuck's presentation will provide um, what I would call more of the context for a case study, which is going to be delivered by Kristen Putman, which you see on your screens now. Kristen is the Director of Global Benefits for Prax Air, and she's among a relative hand, a small handful of people in her position that have taken it upon themselves to really dig into what's going on and with her company's drug benefits. And what she has found and what she's done about it is really a story worth telling. And this is a story that is, I believe, capable of being replicated. And I'm so grateful to having so many people attending this webinar to try and take the key learnings from Chuck and Kristen and apply it to your own workforce. And with that, Chuck, I'm gonna let you do the driving and look forward to your and Kristen's perspectives. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, for being on the phone, and hopefully uh, you'll find this to be a worthwhile use of your time. Uh, I am going to first speak about some research that we conducted on behalf of the National Pharmaceutical Council, uh, going through the background, some of our key findings and implications, and I'm going to try to get through that fairly quickly because you're probably all on the phone really to uh, hear from Kristen and her case example. Also, everything I'm going to say today and talk about is available in a report. Uh, from the national that we've created uh, for the National Pharmaceutical Council on their website, and I'll I'll show that again at the end of my remarks. So the employer research, a little bit about the background and the methodology of the research. Our goal was really to inform a constructive conversation among employer stakeholders about how to move forward toward a more value-focused approach to pharmacy benefit management, and that was again in the context of everything Chris talked about. Our objectives were to understand employer experiences and perspectives related to prescription drugs or prescription benefits management, the importance of the prescription benefit satisfaction uh, of employers with the current situation and their vendors and how things were going, uh, per, uh, perceptions of the prevailing pharmacy benefits management model, uh, priority objectives for improving value and ideas for value improvement. And again, this was research that we were commissioned uh, or uh, uh, engaged to do on behalf of the National Pharmaceutical Council. Uh, methodology, quickly, we uh, spent a good bit of time up front uh, in uh, subject matter uh, expert interviews to gather background information that would guide the content of the survey. And this was a very critical step in the process because, as we'll see, uh, it's difficult to ask uh, some uh, in, in some areas of questioning. Um, there is a degree of uh, confusion um, or lack of awareness of certain issues that makes it difficult to ask about those issues of the people who are experiencing those issues. So we had to be uh, very thoughtful in how we created the survey. So we we conducted these interviews. We then surveyed 88 employers with at least 5,000 employees, uh, and they re represented multiple industries. Uh, we conducted then follow-up interviews with a number of, again, employers and some consultants, uh, completed the analysis, and now this is part of the uh, market education. Uh, so I'm going to buzz through some of the key findings. Uh, we had an early insight about ambiguity. 
Uh, one of the questions in the survey was, uh, does your organization use a transparent or pass-through PBM arrangement? And anticipating, based on our interviews, a little confusion over what that might mean, we provided in the survey a definition in a transparent PBM arrangement that rates negotiated with dispensing pharmacies and manufacturer rebates passed through directly to the plan sponsor in exchange for a higher administrative fee. When we looked at the data, we saw 49% of the respondents said, yes, we have that. And we said, but that's probably not true. So let's go back out to those 49% and ask them again uh, and kind of reiterate our definition maybe with a little more clarity. And so this time we, we amplified the definition a bit uh, saying, you know, we're talking about a full disclosure pass through, provided more definition. And here uh, what we found was um, uh, 34% had of the folks of that 49% had what they considered then a more of a full disclosure uh, PBM where they felt like they were being uh, told everything that needs to be told. And 66% uh, then maintained that they had a pass-through model. So our first lesson from this, even beyond the numbers, um, and the 66% still is maybe a little suspect, an early finding was that the meaning of transparency, when you say transparent PBM, which was the language uh, or is the language often used, is ambiguous. A term that probably shouldn't be ambiguous is quite ambiguous. And that was sort of at the beginning of our learnings. Uh, it's important to know that employers value and func uh, the functions that their PBMs and SPMs perform, uh, being able to negotiate for, uh, you can see here on the, the, the bars representing dark blue line is, uh, are basically the employers say this is very important, a five or six or seven on a seven point scale. So it's important that you have an entity that can no negotiate for cost savings, implement tactics to control costs by assuring use of the most cost effective treatments and so on. Again, I'm not going to go through all the details here because the report's available and I, I encourage you to get it. But the bottom line is that employers value what PBMs do, the functions that they perform. Similar, they value what their specialty pharmacy management uh, organizations uh, do for them. Again, uh, you can see the list here, number one being providing input and recommendations to inform of, uh, their benefit strategy, implementing tactics to control costs by assuring the use of cost, most cost-effective treatments, et cetera. So there's a lot of value in the functions performed by the uh, PBMs and the SPMs. But then we get run into some concerns. We ask some questions, and you can see on the left-hand side of this column, uh, we uh, used four different vendor types, if you will, the consultant, the health plan, the PBM, and the SPM. And we ask employers to essentially uh, rate their uh, uh, alignment, trustworthiness, and satisfaction with their vendors. And you can see that 66% of respondents said that, it, you know, we believe uh, the, the sort of the, the business model of our benefit advisor or consultant is strongly aligned with our interests. 69% uh, say that their benefit consultant advisor is very trustworthy, 62%. Uh, that they're very satisfied overall with the services that they receive from their benefit advisor or consultant. So that's the high bar. But if we look down at how employers responded to similar que the same question about their PBM or SPM, it hovers around a third uh, agreeing that the, the business model is strongly aligned, that they're very trustworthy and very satisfied. I always look at this and I think, man, if that was my customer and I had a third considering me to have a strongly aligned business model, I'd be a little concerned about my business. Now, whether or not there, you know, I'm sure if we had a, a, a if this is a panel discussion and we had a, a large PBM on the phone, they'd say, well, you know, there's just some, some gaps in understanding here or whatever, but perception here is a critical element. Uh, we also look a little, dove a little bit more deeply into specific satisfaction. So you remember seeing the uh, sort of the importance of the various functions. What we did then is uh, asked em uh, employers how, uh, how their vendor was performing against those functions. And in the green bars here, you see sort of, again, the similar rating, five, six, or seven on a seven-point scale. So very good, you would call that. So what we see in just about every instance here on the PBM uh, functions is that the rate of very good performance is far below the rate of uh, strong importance of those functions with the exception of maintaining a network of pharmacies. And the story is similar for uh, especially pharmacy, in fact, even more dramatic. So what we have is a we have a problem with alignment, trust, overall satisfaction, and satisfaction on specific functions. 
So one of the reasons we got into this research is because we would look at broader industry surveys of employer satisfaction with their pharmacy benefits management and it always seemed to paint a fairly rosy picture. We go, that just doesn't sound like what we're hearing when we're doing interviews with employers. And in fact, when we dug down and found the details, there is more to the story here. And the, when, I, when we opened this up, we talked about trying to create a constructive dialogue. And we have always believed that you can't fix something if you can't agree what's broken, right? So the point of the survey wasn't to, you know, load up a bunch of rocks and start throwing them at, at vendors. The point of the survey was to say, look, let's be honest about the problems or the perceived problems. If you think it's a perception issue, then you got to communicate better. If it's more than that, then you need to do more than that. So when we looked at the below the surface of what was going on behind this, this sort of trust and satisfaction issues, what we found was complexity, transparency, and rebates were themes that came up not only in the survey, but in the interviews uh, in very strong terms. And so what we see here is a, sort of an amalgamation of a number of different questions we asked where we asked organization, uh, the survey respondents to agree to a number of, uh, you know, rate their agreement to various statements. But what we see here is fairly striking. 69% of respondents say that uh, strongly agree. So on a, you know, five, six or seven on a seven point scale. Uh, that their company would welcome an, an alternative to rebate-driven approach to managing costs. 63% uh, strongly agree that PBMs lack transparency about how they make money. 58% say that contracts are overly complicated and often harbor clauses that benefit the PBM at the expense of the employer or the patient. A uh, half PBMs lack transparency about how they structure formularies, etc. Now, what's interesting is you go down to the bottom of that. 19% strongly agree that rebates are an effective tool for helping to drive down net price. So just so that we can be clear, we weren't just asking questions throughout these the survey uh, you know, to basically say, well, how often do you beat your wife? You know, that old joke. But this was a, an opportunity for people to say, no, no, rebates are actually very effective. Well, only 19%. Sorry about that. That was a little phone drop there. Only 90% strongly agreed with that. So moving on, uh, this is just a way to picture this idea of transparency, complexity, and rebates, and they are all connected. And uh, they surround these issues of problems, uh, trust alignment, and um, uh, satisfaction. So um, next was we tried to take a look at um, how, well, let me just introduce this real quickly. We In our pre-survey interviews, we talked at length with the folks, the experts we had, were talking with about how can we question employers about how they manage or how well they manage their prescription benefits. And it came to, uh, it was clear early on in those discussions that we can't just ask a question on a one to seven point scale. Would you say you manage your PBM really well uh, or you know poorly to you know really well? Because people wouldn't necessarily know whether they were doing a good job or not. Um, and so they said, well, here's some, and we said, you know, are there behaviors we could look for that would indicate whether an employer was, was paying attention um, and, and doing a good job managing their prescription benefits. And they gave us, uh, uh, I think seven or eight factors and here are five that uh, speak to um, what we found. Uh, so the statement, we basically said, you know, rate your agreement with the following statements. I fully understand our PBM's performance guarantees. 40% strongly agree with that. So four, four out of 10 jumbo self-insured employers who are paying out millions of dollars to provide prescription drug benefits for their employees, 40% of them understand their performance guarantees of their PBM. 30% fully understand the details of the contract that they have with their PBM. 22% say they've invested hours reading and understanding the contract that they have in place, and only 19% understand exactly how their PBM makes money. A little problematic. And you'd say, well, you know, maybe they're just thinking it's not my job. I've got a consultant that does that. So true. 48% um, rely on expertise from their, their benefits advisor, more broadly speaking, and 38% engage separate consultants with expertise in pharmacy benefits. There's a lot of reliance on uh, consultants in this very complicated area of benefit design. But they may not be getting what they should from their consultants because we asked, again, almost behavior-based questions or experience-based questions to try to get a, a 
a sense of the quality of consulting that was happening. And before I review these results, it's worth making the point that we're not saying that consultants are always bad. Oftentimes, consultants are good, but they're not being hired to do the right thing um, because the employer doesn't want to spend money on consulting services or whatever. So there's this is a shared blame issue here. Uh, but when we asked again, this agreement scale, 67% of employers that we surveyed said that they uh, strongly agree that they, being the individual or firm that is helping them with their uh, PBM uh, or pharmacy benefits, does not make money by placing business with any PBMs. 28% aren't sure, 5% disagree. I think if you ask most objective industry um, observers, they'd say that the reality of this is that many of the large firms make money through uh, other arrangements they have, not directly with the, the consultant in front of you, but with the, the organization in general, and it does create potential conflicts. 56% uh, strongly agree that they that their consultant works through with them through the course of the year. 56% say that their consultant has identified a problematic issues with their PBM contract. Again, ob objective ob industry observer would say that really is probably closer, should be 100%, because there's always something in that contract that is problematic if you're looking out for the interests of the employer and their, and their employees. 55% uh, say they've, that the person they deal with has industry experience, in other words, has been um, within the PBN industry and knows the details of how contracts are structured and how money is made. And you can see the rest of those results here. So again, the point is that there's a heavy reliance on consulting, but the consulting is, uh, the quality of the consultant can't be taken for granted. Let's put it that way. Here's another indicator. We, ha um, we asked, has your organization ever evaluated the option of a transparent PBM? We saw that 44% uh, said yes, 56% no. We thought, okay, well, let's ask the next question, which is if you haven't, why haven't you? 50% 50, 50 say we don't know enough about transparent PBM models. 29% our consultant has not recommended uh, evaluating a transparent PBM. So this survey was done less than a year ago. And so the issue of prescription benefits management and the questions about whether there's really good value or there's money being wasted in, in the supply chain is not new. And for a, an employer not to have enough information or have thought about it or have been recommended to even take a look at it. Again, sir, sort of brings to mind, is the consultant really doing their job? Again, can't be taken for granted. So toward better value, um, not, not a surprise if, if the issues that we looked at, the, the root of it all was, you know, so it's idea of transparency, complexity, and, and rebates. Those are the things that employers target um, in various questions when we asked about what were your most important, you know, what are the most important objectives of making, of getting better value, you know, improving transparency, simplifying contracts and providing full disclosure. Um, highest priority ideas had to do with replacing rebates with discounts, efficacy based reimbursement, value based insurance design. And when we asked employers about their most likely future scenario, the number one response was a transparent future that employers were either maintain a more of a transparent relationship that they have with a with a PBM, which the caveat is that early in the survey, we're not quite sure people knew what they were saying and responding to, but there's interest in this idea of a more transparent past through future. So uh, this chart is basically, uh, we did a, a two by two, and um, we looked at trust and satisfaction, sort of a composite of those um, trust satisfaction and um, uh, uh, alignment questions on the, on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal, we looked at sort of the engagement in PBM management. So that question, those sets of questions of how employers are, how much they're, they know their, about their contract, et cetera. And what we found was not a, and I'm not going to say this is a super strong relationship, but if you look at the, most of the, most of the data points fall on the upper right, the lower left. And so, you look at that and you go, well, there's an indication that there's a sort of relationship between how engaged is an employer in the management of prescription benefits and how, how much trust satisfaction um, do they have with their vendor. And the implication might be that the more engaged an employer is, the more satisfied they, they may end up being, or they may be dissatisfied, but moving towards satisfaction because they're looking into it. And you might always, one of, one of our consultants had a, so the funny thing, well, people in the lower left-hand box 
I sort of like the, the guys getting together at the bar after work and just kind of complaining about their boss. Um, they're not really get prepared to do anything about it. They're just going to complain about it. And those in the lower right-hand corner are perhaps working on the issue in the upper right-hand corner would represent those organizations that have, uh, that are, that are engaged and happy. And, uh, and here's what we found about if you just concentrate on the right-hand side here, the attributes of that upper right-hand box, they have the highest appreciation for the importance of their PBM functions um, or the value of the, the, the PBM value proposition. They have the lowest level of concern with PBM business model. They have the highest quality consulting support and their choices represent uh, the, a diverse uh, future. So they're not looking just at transparent, they're maybe working with their traditional PBM toward a, gr a greater value or they might even be looking at direct purchasing. So all those options were offered and, 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 the, and there was the greatest variety of interest on that upper right-hand box of the model. Again, this information is in that report. So our key point summary here, um, you know, the large majority of employers value the functions that, the, that are being performed by their PBM or SPM. Employers share concerns about alignment, trustworthiness, and satisfaction. These concerns are rooted in complexity, transparency, and rebates. And because employers lack internal expertise and resources to manage their benefits, they must rely on consultants, but many consulting, consultants or consulting relationships, relationships are not performing as they should. And so to achieve improvement, employers need to focus on complexity, transparency, and rebates. Uh, probably don't necessarily need uh, uh, revolutionary change, but need to, need to focus on those issues. Um, and do that by becoming more engaged, probably, you know, possibly improving your uh, consulting support in those areas. So I'm going to just point out one last time that if you go to uh, npcnow.org, you have not only a, uh, a monograph that I think it's about 20 page monograph that has all the data that I've talked about today, but we also created based on those two questions we reviewed about uh, employer engagement and consultant quality, just tools that an employer can take, kind of self-assess, like, am I spending enough time reading the contract? Uh, and if I'm not willing to do that, I better have really good consulting support. So I need to make sure that the consulting support that I'm getting, not only is we do have a good consultant, but I'm hiring them the right way. I'm engaging them for the right stuff. So I'll look forward to any questions you may have on that, but I'm going to quickly move to introduce Kristen and uh, her case study on Praxair. Thanks, Chuck, Kristen, and thanks. Yep. Okay, well, thanks for allowing me to share Praxair's story on managing pharmacy benefits. Um, first, I'd like to give a quick overview of Praxair's business and employee base so that you can get an idea of the type of employees that I work with. So Praxair is a Fortune 250 company. Uh, we are the largest industrial gases company in North and South America and one of the largest worldwide. We produce, sell, and distribute atmospheric process and specialty gases along with high performance surface coatings. And we have 27,000 employees, 9,000 in the US, and we do have a lot of union employees in our benefit programs. So really this next slide represents in layman's terms what Praxair does. We put the fizz in soda, the ease in breathing, the spark in welding, the clean in diesel, the wonder in sea exploration, and the zoom in cars. In this presentation, I plan to explain Praxair's pharmacy benefit value roadmap that's outlined in this slide. But first, I want to talk about what prompted step one of the journey. Over time, it became very apparent that traditional PBMs make money on every drug and every pill that every participant takes. And as we question their practices and learn what they tell Wall Street, we realized that their interests were not aligned with managing pharmacy costs the way we would want them managed. Even still, they continue to tell Wall Street how much money they make on specialty drugs, while at the same time telling us how much money they save on specialty drugs. And we all know that PBMs do not manufacture specialty drugs, so why should they profit so much on the drugs that our employees take and that we all pay for? 
it was really this frustration with the standard model that caused Praxair to become very involved in the ongoing management of our prescription drug program. So before 2015, we found a relatively effective way to work with our PBM, but it was very time intensive. We requested all of our data, and our PBM started to provide this data back in around the year 2000. And at first, we didn't even realize the value of this request. We received files that included all data, such as the AWP price, the actual ingredient cost, the category of drug, whether they're labeling something a brand or generic. And the unintended consequence was that this data became the source of most of our future findings and something we therefore continue to require of all future PBMs over time. This level of detail, I feel, is so important in terms of understanding drug spend and where there is overspend. We also, early on, customized our formulary. We had heard stories about overpriced drugs in the media, and we looked at our own data, which we had, and that led us to want to customize our formulary. At first, I remember we, we received pushback from our PBM. They tried to intimidate us by saying that if we did customize our preferred drug list, we would have liability. So when we deflected the question back to the PBM saying that, oh, they must have the liability now if we don't customize, they quickly changed their story and said, well, really, there's no liability for anyone about the preferred drug list. So ultimately, the PBM did agree to quarterly meetings to discuss all of the drugs that were changing status on their formulary. The PBM, though, would often tell us that if we, did, if we did eliminate some of these drugs that they were recommending, we would lose rebates. We then started to ask them, well, let's calculate the expected rebate dollars that we'd be losing. And in almost every case, the rebates weren't worth chasing. Looking back, we probably didn't add 90 plus percent of the drugs that they were recommending. And over the time, the PBM became more casual when walking through the changes that they were making. And they would say to us, a client like Praxair probably wouldn't want to add this drug or make this change. And I remember specifically asking, well, what client would want to add that drug if they understood the value proposition? And the response was really just an awkward silence. So the next major area of concern became customizing clinical edits. After we had the preferred drug list in decent shape, we started asking questions about clinical edits. When we weren't getting sufficient responses, we realized we probably have to customize those too. So typically, the clinical edits that were in place were either looser or not as timely as we thought they should be. And I'll give you an example. We asked for help managing compounds. In 2012, we identified the problem as we were getting our data, and we noticed some costly drugs on the file that didn't have drug names. So we brought it to the PBM's attention. At first, they didn't offer a solution, but we continued to pursue the issue. And almost a year later, they finally offered a solution of a prior auth for drugs over a certain dollar thresh threshold. Although we didn't have a solution until 2013, most of the abuse by the compounders was in 2014. The PBMs, though, didn't encourage their other clients to put an edit on the compounds until late 2014, early 2015, when it was a more widely understood problem. So there were many other examples, and we just kept realizing that, unfortunately, we needed to be much more involved in the setup process of these edits. By the time the realizations happened and the concerns were voiced to the PBM, and the time before the tighter management went into effect, Praxair was continuing to pay high prices for things that we thought we shouldn't, and the PBM was making money. Um, the contracting process, too, under this model was very burden burdensome for us and very time-consuming. Negotiating the contract took months as we had to examine every word in the contract. The audits revealed that the policies we negotiated and a lot of the customizations that our PBM agreed to weren't always enacted. 
and our audit results yielded significant results, which was also very bothersome. So this heavy management approach, although time consuming, did yield good results. Praxair paid about 70% of the book of business number reported by the PBM. But even with that success, we wanted to find a way to manage pharmacy that was just as or more effective and just wasn't as time intensive. So what prompted our constant pursuit of improving transparency started with accessing our data and the frustration from not getting our questions answered in a timely manner. Throughout the years, we looked long and hard for a good pharmacy consultant. We struggled to find a consultant that could teach us more than we already knew. And we were never sure if it was because the, pharm the consultant didn't know or they just didn't want to let on. And at one point I explained my frustration to a friend that worked at a traditional PBM. And in his role, he knew most of the pharmacy consultants. So he introduced me to a small pharmacy consulting firm called, called Integrity Pharmaceutical Advisors. And my first introduction to Tom and his firm was like a breath of fresh air. I had finally found someone who I thought could truly make an impact on our pharmacy costs. Tom ultimately persuaded us then to meet with a smaller but completely transparent and pass-through PBM. I didn't even know those existed at the time. And this was another turning point. He knew how frustrated we were with all the time and energy it took to manage our PBM. So when we met with Navitus Health Solutions, it was a markedly different conversation than what we had heard before. Their interests were completely aligned with ours as they only make money through a per member, per month administrative fee. And soon after the initial meeting with Navitus, we realized we needed to do an RFP. It became very apparent during the finalist presentations that Navitus was a great fit for us. So effective July 2015, Navitus became our new PBM and so far, the experience with Navitus has been tremendous, and I'll outline some of the key differences between Navitus and the traditional PBMs. The biggest overriding difference boils down to the full alignment and transparency with the client, and this has led to significant saving. The reason our current PBM works so well for us starts with the transparency. Transparent and pass through in every way. We pay what they pay for the drug. They don't pay something for the drug and charge us more as is typical. The incentives are aligned to our needs as they work transparently for us. If they don't do a good job for us, you know, we're gonna get performance guarantees or we're gonna move on because all they're getting is the administrative fee. Their formulary fit our philosophy and we felt pretty sure that they would manage that way going forward, and they have. And our PBM is always willing to work with us to adopt formulary and clinical edits. They don't have trouble customizing. And the data is easy to access and it's 100% transparent. So, what do I mean by genuine transparency? Transparency is a term, as Chuck said, that's often thrown around. It becomes muddled in its meaning. So let's hone in on why we consider our approach transparent. First, the traditional models are set up to make money off every pill our participants take. So it is really not in their financial interest to reduce the number of pills. Often PBO PBM revenue is a percentage of the cost of the drug, so it's not in their financial interest to encourage the most cost-effective drug in a therapeutic class. But now with Navitus, we pay what they pay for the drug. The only PBM revenue that they get is a per-member, per-month administrative fee, similar to how most benefit vendors charge for their service. Why should the PBM industry be any different? This makes their incentive to really manage our drugs both clinically and cost-effectively aligned with ours. With Navitus, the data is easy to access, complete, and 100% transparent. 
we didn't even have to ask for the data. It's just part of the offering, and it's put in a user-friendly database with all of the elements needed for proper assessment. The data we used to receive from our previous PBM was an Excel file with over 17,000 records per month that we had to manipulate. Regarding the formulary, most of the formulary that we had worked so hard to achieve over the years was already the formulary of Navitus. They had overall cost-effective drugs at the preferred levels in each therapeutic class, and they often only had generics at the preferred levels. They also allow for customization because every client has different needs. Although pharmaceutical manufacturers do provide rebates, the rebates don't drive the decision-making with Navitus since they are all passed through to their clients. In addition, we didn't have to worry about the clinical edits. When I first met with Navitus, I asked them questions on how they treated several drugs, which I had to push for better criteria with my traditional PBM. Each answer that they were giving me was, in my opinion, the ideal state with no prodding and no waiting for implementation. Contracting with Navitus was a breeze. It took about three weeks instead of about nine months. And they actually have language in the recitals page, the, the first page of their contract that talks about zero spread, transparent, full pass-through, where all discounts and rebates are provided to clients. Their customer service is excellent, the transition was smooth, and they always receive very high marks on the PBMI survey for client satisfaction. It's important to note, too, that the typical RFP process may not reflect capabilities and results of transparent PBM. An example is the AWP discounts and the rebate guarantees in a transparent model may not appear as competitive as it does as in a traditional model. But remember, we pay what they pay for the drugs, and they pass all rebates on to us. It's really just that simple. So we look at the bottom line of what the plan pays on a per member, per month basis. It is so important for a consultant to be able to ditch the old spreadsheeting process and really come up with a way to value what your bottom line number is now and what they will be under a new deal. Also, I would be very wary of credit allowances. Offering credit allowances likely means that the PBM is receiving hidden revenue in your contract. So we believe that data is necessary to understand formulary and clinical edit changes. And we also believe that we need to, at the same time, minimize member disruption and educate our employees to gain buy-in where possible. When this is done in a disciplined manner, changes are accepted and costs are controlled. So the financial results. Financial results with our small PBM are significantly better than they were. We didn't understand how much better the results would be or we would have moved much sooner. There's so much unnecessary spending in a traditional PBM. So you can see from the bar charts above that our costs in 2014 were $65.06 per member per month. For the 2017 calendar year, our costs were $69.46 per member per month. That's only a 7% increase over all that time. And at the same time, specialty has increased 53%, and about half of our costs are for specialty drugs versus traditional. Now we are almost on autopilot in terms of managing the day-to-day -day process of doing the right things for the plan. We finally have a PBM with both clinical and cost effectiveness in mind. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about Artemis. Artemis is a data warehouse consulting firm, and we use them for our data warehouse. They have examined over $195 million worth of pharmaceutical spend. And within that, they've identified about $21 million in potential overspending for all of their clients. And this is an average of 
$15.71 per employee, not per member, per month. So when they ran the same algorithm on the Praxair data, they identified literally zero potential overspending. And this is attributed to the much more optimally designed formulary. A simple ROI calculation on that would show that Praxair saved one and a half million dollars per year just on this more aggressive formulary management. And we can attribute some of this to um, IPA, Integrity Pharmaceutical Advisors, our consultant, because they're still involved in helping us set the formulary as we want to be a little more aggressive than the standard Navitas formulary. So in addition to the historical trends being good, Praxair's total cost per member per month compares very favorable, favorably to the PMPMs reported by the large PBM. Not only is the per member per month much lower at face value, but Praxair carves out a significant amount of specialty spend out of the medical plan and requires that it go through the specialty pharmacy benefits. This additional piece is often not included in other large company pharmacy PMPMs. And for Praxair, it's valued at almost $14. So really, you know, just to show the difference, you would take the difference from either the CVS or ESI and subtract the Praxair, multiply that times the number of members, which we have 19,000, and times the number of months to really figure out what the savings is by being with a Navitus versus um, one of the bigger PBMs. So we really feel that members um, are, have been okay with this change, because I know a lot of employers are concerned um, with member disruption, but a lot of our employees have, have felt this was a positive change. With the coinsurance structure, both the member and the plan would pay less for the same clinical efficacy if the member was on a less expensive drug. So how do we minimize employee angst? First, our PBM sends letters to the patients and physicians in the event of a change in formulary. In addition, we typically grandfather participants for 90 days in order to give them enough time to change their medication with their provider. If there's some unique reason why they need the more expensive drug, their doctor can work with Navitus to allow them to continue the drug. When employees call HR and we have the chance to walk the employee through the issue, they almost always seem to understand, and many are even grateful as they never knew there was a similar drug that was so low cost. When IPA walks through clinical efficacy with doctors, along with the pricing of the drugs in the class, the doctors often didn't know how expensive the drug was either, and were happy to switch the patient to another drug in the same therapeutic class. So we have to ask ourselves, why would we want to allow unfettered access to overpriced drugs when only a handful of people may need that slightly different formulation and the rest of the population would be as good or better off with the value price product. So really, that's Praxair's story. And now I just want to share some con concluding thoughts on the next couple of pages. The PBM evaluation process should include the opportunity for a transparent and pass-through PBM to demonstrate and explain their capabilities directly. If you don't have full access to your data, your ability to access, access performance is hindered. And transparent PBMs have nothing to hide and have no issue showing your books, unlike traditional PBMs. There appears to be little correlation between purchasing power of large PBMs and plan sponsor drug costs. If there were, our results with our traditional PBM and the big PBM book of business numbers that I shared would probably be a lot better than our numbers with Navitus. And the consulting spreadsheeting process needs a major overhaul. We pay consultants to think, 
not to recycle RFPs and models that have been sitting on their shelf for many years. Through all of this additional management, one of the major learnings was that the employer has to aggressively pursue answers to their questions. Usually, we wouldn't get good answers initially. There seemed to be a lot of st stalling, a lot of hurdles that we had to jump through before we could put in some of the tro programs that really would truly manage our costs. Then there was always the time that it would take to implement the changes. Often it would take months to actually implement a change. And throughout the delay, the PBM was making more money than they would have if they acted quickly. For consultants, it is not in many of their best interests to aggressively pursue a PBM that they have financial ties with. They will typically steer you to their coalition before they will help with an independent deal. Be wary of promise savings. I've recently heard and didn't realize this before, that consultants can get paid for placing business with certain PBMs, regardless of whether the coalition is involved. And that really doesn't seem like transparent alignment to me. And on the last slide, for PBMs, just read and listen to the earnings reports of the big PBMs. They tell their shareholders how much money they're making off of drugs, and they tell clients how much they're saving. And remember, good consultants like Integrity Pharmaceutical Advisors and good PBMs like Navitus are harder to find, and we really need to look beyond the big names who have allowed and often encouraged this misalignment to continue and worsen over time. It's the, if the big names have this great purchasing power, they're certainly not passing it along to us. So now I just want to say thank you very much and turn it back to Chuck for Q&A. Uh, hi, right, everyone. This is, this is Chris McSwain. If you, if you would, please send in your, your questions. And, and while you're thoughtfully doing so, I'll have a, a couple of, of my own. And first, thank you so much, uh, Chuck and Kristen, for both the research that set the context and for the wonderful case study that uh, Praxair uh, provides. Um, this is such an over seemingly whelming um, challenge, uh, Kristen. I'm certain that of the folks that are on the, the line with us on the webinar are, are in one way or another trying to contemplate where to get started could you offer your perspective of where a reasonable place for a, a typical employer who has not gone through the journey you've you've gone through would be to get started? Sure, I, and I really think I, I said it in the presentation, but it really starts with the data. Um, if you don't have the data, it's really hard to question what's going on in the arrangement and you end up typically then being listening to what they tell you as to you know questioning things that just don't seem right so i really think it's with the data and i really you know next i would say you know looking around for the right consultant the right consultant is someone who can really teach you new things not the same old thing we've been hearing for many years Okay, thanks, Kristen. You know, some of the research, Chuck, that you provided in the very beginning was really contemplating a PPM versus an SPM. Um, from either your or Kristen's perspective, which of those two arrangements would you go first in trying to improve as far as priorities? I will yield that to Kristen. You know, and I, I guess I would just argue that if you have a transparent pass through PBM, they're already, you know, working diligently and making sure that you're getting the lower price. So, so why would you need to, you know, go outside and, and get more vendors in play? Okay, we're beginning to get a few questions in. Let me ask one more. Um, from your perspective, Kristen, you've got global benefits, so you're managing not only the pharmacy benefit, but also the health plans that are supportive. 
Um, what, could you share with the group what your thinking is related to adherence? Who do you think has responsibility for providing accountability on adherence? Is it the PBM or the health plan? Um, well, I really think it's, you know, the health benefits plan overall, which includes pharmacy. So we need to make sure that, you know, the costs are reasonable. Um, and part of the way that we make our premiums reasonable is by making sure that people are getting the drugs that are, you know, the lower cost drugs with the same value as the higher cost drugs. We, we try to keep our premiums low and affordable, but we do favor high deductible health plans. Um, I know there's controversy about whether or not you know, there's adherence issues with those, but when we look at our overall numbers, we don't we don't seem to have an issue with that. And we do something that's somewhat unique on the on the overall side, medical and pharmacy, is we have pay based out of pocket maximum. So, um, the more money you make, the more your out of pocket maximum is. So we try to um, weave in some affordability that way. Kristen, a question that's come in is: Are, are you managing your your uh, pharmacy benefit uh, on the medical side where a PPM isn't involved. And the example extended was biosimilars um, where uh, particularly with infused products, uh, they are often managed on the medical side. So how do you sort that out? Yeah, so wherever possible, we do carve those drugs out of medical and have them go through pharmacy because you can control um, the cost much more so under pharmacy. Um, but there are certain categories, you know, which we we still haven't had the guts to touch, um, like a lot of the oncology drugs that are infused. Um, a lot of the drugs um, that go with the oncology drugs, though, we do now carve out of medical and put into pharmacy. But we don't want to make it too disruptive for the person. But, you know, we carve out uh, Remicade, IVIG drugs, things like that. Um, so we've done a lot of that. And you need a really good partner, um, you know, in terms of your PBM, if you plan to do that, because that makes the process go much more smoothly if they're, you know, very um, proactive reaching out, making sure that the the patient does land in a good spot. Okay, uh, thank you. Sorry for the siren noise in the background. Um, let me, this is really a question from the employee perspective. Uh, how did you consider employees out of pocket exposure when you were going through all of your changes? And what specific steps, if any, did you take to reduce that exposure? Um, the employees out-of-pocket expenses. I mean, if 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 we lead them to the cheaper and more cost-effective drugs, then you know they have less out-of-pocket exposure. We also have two tiers of generics, so we have you know very low coinsurance on tier one, um, higher on tier two. Then we have preferred. Uh, brands and non-preferred brands. Non-preferred brands, you're going to pay a lot for. It's 50%, um, and there is no maximum on your, um, you know, coinsurance limit. So, and then we have a separate tier for specialty drugs. So we do try to think about that, but with our high deductible health plans, you know, other than some of the preventive drugs, you do need to meet the deductible first. Then we try to buffer that with the pay-based out-of-pocket maximums. Okay. Uh, thanks. I'm going to come back to the high deductible plan with a question in just a moment. But Chuck, before I do that, there's a lot of work that I know you've personally done through the years in trying to recognize the uh, all the supplier uh, supply chains that make up the large parts of either the health plan or, in this case, the pharmacy benefit. From your experiences and from the research that was conducted by uh, your your group and NPC, um, how would you describe, in your words, the difference between a, a vendor uh, and a partner? And I, I think Kristen gave us some great um, perspectives in the in the ones that she's using. But uh, I'd love to get your point of view on that. Yeah, um, I think the in, in terms of the supply chain and, and the for an employer to, for an employer to manage the health benefits supply chain, in this case, pharma, uh, pharmacy benefits. What the employer should be able to do 
is take a look at that supply chain and articulate to its uh, suppliers what is the what the value is that they're trying to buy. So in Kristen's instance, I'm not going to put words in her mouth, but based on her presentation, it's pretty safe to say that we want efficacious medicines that are uh, affordably accessible to our uh, to our employees and their dependents, and we want to eliminate waste wherever possible. And what her experience would show is she had partner or she had she had uh, suppliers that were not partners because they did not embrace that that quest for value by Praxair. They rather uh, essentially tried to change the subject, if you will, by delaying answering questions or saying we're going to do this, but then they don't do it. And that's an entirely different attitude than they've gotten from their uh, uh, PBM of choice now, Navitus, which uh, essentially said, yeah, we'll help you do that and uh, makes all the data available, et cetera. So there's that the, the fundamental thing is, and this should happen in all areas of employee benefit, uh, health benefit purchasing, is the employer should be able to trust their vendors to do vendors to do everything they can to capture the value that is being articulated. And if the value is not reasonable for some reason, let's have a conversation about that. But uh, it shouldn't be complicated. And it shouldn't be zero sum where everybody, every stakeholder along the supply chain is trying to maximize their profitability. There's plenty of that going on out there. And I think what Kristen has found is a, is a partner that that is willing to take a reasonable profit for providing the service uh, of delivering value to, to a Praxair. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Kristen, as I heard your story, um, there's a few things that came to my mind, one of which that's, that's germane to everybody on the call is, you know, there's a set of competencies that you have acquired through the process that you have gone through that you described to us today. Looking back, what are some of the um, core competencies that you feel you've either had to renew or to, uh, to uh, gain that you did not previously have that let you undertake the innovations and the improvements that you mentioned through the Praxair story today? So I would say, you know, the main reason that, that you know, Praxair is where we are today is because we had the data and we were relentless questioners. And, and as much as they tried to get us off track, defer us, not answer the question, we kept coming back, coming back, coming back. And I think we wore them down. Um, and so they treated us in a somewhat unique manner, but nowhere near the way we are treated with Navitas. So I think, I think they understood we were not gonna, you know, be pushovers. And so they did certain things for us, but if we didn't keep questioning, 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 then you know we would we would be in the same boat as as most employers, and you know it it just caused us to do more reading and research and keep looking at our data. It kind of drove us crazy <laughs> that we weren't able to get you know good answers to our questions. Uh, thanks. You know, I've, I've been in through the years a, a number of quarterly meetings with uh, the suppliers um, connected to this supply chain. And and often, with all respect to uh, the, the benefits teams, uh, we're often, if you will, outgunned uh, from the level of uh, capability and experiences and education from the folks on the other side of the table, if you will. So just to confirm, you or did anyone on, did you, do you or anyone on your team have a D classification that uh, equipped you or was this all from your hard work and diligence to uh, read and learn as you described? Yeah, it was all from learning and hard work and, and just staying on top of it. And I've even had you know, other um, employers ask me, well, you know, you seem to spend so much time on, on pharmacy, but, you know, that's not where the real money is. And I would argue that is where the real low-hanging fruit is. That is the easiest money to get back for the plan. You know, to manage a high-cost claimant, that gets a lot trickier than, than managing these drugs where there's, you know, 
perfectly suitable drugs out there at, you know, a quarter of the cost of, of other drugs. And uh, the last question does come back to the high deductible health plan. It says, the comment is that there seems to be a remarkable noise on the accumulator copay benefit design for high deductible health plans. Do you have any comments on this evolving design? Well, we do. We continue to offer a PPO plan where the drugs do not, um, you, you know, the drugs are outside of the deductible. So people who want that type of arrangement can have that. Um, but we have, you know, at this point, we have 72% of our people in a high deductible health plan. And I think I mentioned in the beginning, we have a lot of union employees in our in our health plans. Um, we have lower paid, higher paid. In fact, I wouldn't even say we have an inordinate number of higher paid versus lower paid. Maybe there's a, there's a you know, if you look at it by pay, there's slightly more higher paid in the high deductible health plan, but not much. It might be 45, you know, 55 or something like that. You know, it, it's, it's the top of the hour. I'm going to just work in one last question. I'm, I'm curious about how you handled this. It, within your own employees, uh, body and families. How did you position the changes that you were making? Um, and I'll, I'll give you two extremes. One was it sort of all about the company and we're here to to save money um, to lower our benefit cost, or was it on a different side of the continuum where we're using our company's resources to try and apply a better benefit that provides higher value at lower cost for the member? Essentially, it's a change management question that you may have undertaken as a part of your work. Yeah, so, so you know, initially when we started down this path, we, we basically started communicating, showing the prices of different drugs in a therapeutic class and, you know, talking about how, you know, if you if you take these really expensive drugs, it hits the plan cost, it raises the premiums for everybody. Um, and you know now, since about fifty percent of our drug spend is specialty drugs, you know we also talk about how the fact how we need to you know overcome the fact that these drugs are so expensive nowadays, but some of them are are pure lifesavers, so why would we want to spend money on things that really you know has a, a clinical counterpart that's that's much cheaper? We need to conserve money on some of these traditional drugs or some of these combo drugs in order to pay for these, you know, life-saving curing drugs like some of the hep C products. You and Kristen are heartfelt thanks for the hard work that you put into both the research and for the case study efforts and what a tremendous um, example for uh, everyone to learn from and to uh, hopefully implement many of the things that we've heard today. We'll be uh, posting a, a copy, a recording of our t webinar today on the IBI's website. In the meantime, I wish everyone a terrific day and again, our thanks to the speakers. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Good day, everyone.